In part two of the price elasticity of demand lecture, we're going to learn another way to determine whether demand for a product is elastic or inelastic uh, based on using the formula, the midpoint method formula. Um, so just as review here, price elasticity of demand is a measure of the responsiveness of the quantity demanded of a good to a change in its price, all else being equal. And uh, again, just to review, we, we just got done learning about the total revenue test, which is one way of determining whether demand for a product is elastic or inelastic. And now we're going to learn um, a second way of determining elasticity of demand. So when thinking about different types of goods and services, um, there are some, some uh, determinants that we can consider that help us kind of figure out whether demand would be more or less elastic for certain goods. So just in general, in our thinking, um, substitutability, considering the number of substitutes available for a product, um, that's going to play a role in consumer responsiveness to price changes. So if there are substitutes available for a good, then consumers will be very responsive to price changes or demand will be very elastic. Um, if substitutes are not available for a good, then consumers don't have the luxury of being responsive to price changes, so demand is more inelastic. Proportion of income spent on the product, you know, how expensive something is, is going to matter. Um, if you go to the gas station to buy a pack of gum, a small priced item, and the price has increased by 20%, you probably won't even notice, and you're probably going to buy that gum anyway. So the price change isn't going to have an impact on buyers. Buyers are not going to be very responsive to price changes for small priced items, but larger priced items, for example, if you went to a car dealership to buy a new car and noticed that the price of the new car you're planning on buying jumped up 20%, um, that might cause you to, you know, possibly change your mind and reconsider your purchase. So buyers will be responsive or demand will be more elastic for large purchases um, that that take up a large proportion of their income and demand will be less elastic or more inelastic for small purchases. Alright, the next clue is luxury versus necessity. Um, is it something you want or just or, or, or something that you need? Um, if you need it, you don't have the luxury to be responsive as responsive to price changes, so demand would be more inelastic. But if it's something that you just want, then you can be more responsive to price changes and demand will be more elastic. If something's habit forming, if someone's addicted to something, it's viewed as a necessity and so demand would be more inelastic. Time is going to play a role. Um, the amount of time that you have to make a purchase. For example, I am a procrastinator so I, for example, will be driving to a birthday party and say, oh, I should probably stop and buy that person a card and some flowers. So I'm going to stop at whatever um, is convenient on my way, pay whatever price they're asking, and I don't have the luxury of shopping around for a good price or being responsive to price changes. So in when you're in a pinch, when you need something immediately, demand is um, very inelastic. But if you have the luxury to shop around and you don't need it immediately, then demand would be more elastic. And then finally, breadth of definition. Um, for example, if I were to ask you to compare the elasticity of demand for skim milk to milk in general, um, we would say demand for skim milk is more elastic because there are more choices, right? Instead of skim milk, you could have 2%, 1%, whole milk, soy milk, almond milk, whatever. The possibilities are endless. Um, but milk in general, milk is a broader category. So demand for milk would be more inelastic, demand for skim milk would be more elastic if you were comparing the two. Alright, so when calculating elasticity, I mentioned before we're going to use the midpoint method. The changes in price and quantity are expressed as percentages of the average price and average quantity, which avoids having two values for the price elasticity of demand. So the general um, formula here, I'll give you a more detailed version on the next slide, is that price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price um, and the absolute value of the answer will be considered. So if there's a negative sign you're going to drop the negative sign. 
here's a more detailed form of the equation. Um, what you need to know here is this this um, very detailed version in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So always remember that the percentage change in price is going to be in terms of dollars. Dollars always go in the denominator. Um, that's a nice little way to help you remember. Quantity is always in the numerator. Dollars always in the denominator so you don't flip-flop your equation and get the wrong answer. But um, here in this detailed version of the equation here, quantity minus quantity one, so the difference in the two quantities over the average of the two quantities. So an average is just adding the two together and dividing by two since there's two of them. So the difference in the two quantities over the average of the two quantities and then in the denominator, we have dollars in the denominator, the difference in the two prices over the average of the two prices. So this isn't as complicated as it looks. Um, you just simply plug the data in and, and you'll come up with a numerical answer that will be your coefficient of elasticity and we'll learn in a minute what that answer is going to mean. All right, one other note is I, I mentioned that we ignore the negative sign and we take the absolute value of the answer. The reason for this is that according to the law of demand, whenever price increases, quantity demanded decreases and vice versa. So the coefficient of elasticity of demand is always going to be negative anyway. So we will always get a negative answer. To make things easier, economists simply ignore the negative sign. Someone decided a long time ago, we're just going to drop that negative sign, and if you state your answer and forget to drop the negative sign, if you state it in terms of a negative number, it would be considered incorrect. So make sure that you get in the habit of dropping the negative sign for price elasticity of demand um, calculations. All right, so here's an example. Um, this is looking at a, a portion of the demand curve for computer chips. Um, at the original price of $410, 36 million chips per year can be sold. And if the price drops to $390, 44 million chips per year will be sold. So the different um, values that we're going to need for our equation are we're going to need to know the difference in prices and the difference in quantities, so the change in price and the change in quantity. And then we're also going to need to know the average price and the average quantity. All right, so all those values are shown here. And when we plug those into the equation, again, difference in quantity over average quantities in the numerator and the change in prices over the average prices are in the denominator. Our answer is negative four, but since we consider the absolute value of the answer, um, our final answer will be 4 when we drop that negative sign. And we still haven't explained what that means, but we'll get there shortly. So there are three demand curves that cover the entire range of possible elasticities of demand. Perfectly inelastic, unit elastic, and then on the other end of the spectrum, perfectly elastic. In reality, perfectly inelastic and perfectly elastic demand um, don't don't really exist. I can't think of an example in reality of those two extremes, um, but theoretically they're possible, so we have to learn about them. Perfectly inelastic demand means that quantity demanded remains constant when price changes occur. So if you were to calculate the elasticity of demand using the formula and get an answer of zero, that, that would imply that demand is perfectly inelastic. So an answer of zero means perfectly inelastic demand. Your demand curve would, would look like this. It would be a completely vertical line. And like I said, this is, um, I, I truly don't believe this is possible in reality, but some examples that would be close are things that people absolutely need no matter what the price. Um, but even these examples aren't, good, aren't perfect examples because we're going to get to some price point where people aren't going to be able to afford even the things that they absolutely need and they'd have to drop out of the market. So um, perfectly inelastic demand though, um, again, theoretically is possible in reality, not so much, but it will give us an answer of zero. All right, in the middle we have unit elastic demand, which implies that the percentage change in quantity demanded exactly equals the percentage change in price. Uh, we learned about this in the first part of the elasticity of demand lecture. And when your value in the numerator and your value in the denominator of your equation are the same, when you divide anything by itself, you're going to get an answer of 1. So when, when your 
coefficient of elasticity is 1, then that means demand is unit elastic. And, you know, any this could be anything, examples, anything, as long as total revenue doesn't change when the price changes. At the other end of the spectrum, we have perfectly elastic demand. Again, uh, you know, in reality, I don't think this is um, really going to happen too often, but theoretically it's possible. This implies that if price increases by any percentage, quantity demanded will fall to zero. And if price decreases by any percentage, quantity demanded will rise to infinity. <laughs> and the price elasticity of demand is not definable. The demand curve would be a completely horizontal line. Um, and the best example I can give you to, to you know, give you some kind of a picture of what this would mean, again, this probably wouldn't happen in reality, but let's say you're walking out of a, a, a grocery store and there's four gumball machines and they all sell gumballs for a quarter, um, but one gumball machine decided to increase its price to 26 cents. So quantity demanded at that gumball machine would fall to zero. Nobody would buy gumballs from that gumball machine because the price increased. Everybody would buy from the other gumballs, uh, gumball machines instead. All right, so in summary, here are the different values of, of elasticity of demand that you'll need to be familiar with. Um, we just learned that perfectly inelastic demand gives you an answer of zero. Inelastic demand is somewhere in between perfectly inelastic demand and unit elastic demand. So if your answer is greater than zero but less than one, demand is inelastic. Again, reviewing, if your answer is exactly one, then demand is unit elastic. If your answer is somewhere in between unit elastic and perfectly elastic, then that means demand's elastic. So if your coefficient of elasticity is any number greater than one, then that just tells us that demand is elastic. So these are the way that you'll the way that you interpret your your answers to the the elasticity formula. Um, this is this is your legend, what you need to know. <laughs> So I think most people would agree that the total revenue test is a much easier way of determining elasticity, but you will need to know how to use the formula and be familiar with um, what the answers mean. So let's do an example here of using the formula. We'll use the same example that we used earlier when showing the total revenue test. If the original price of the good is $15 and five units can be sold, and the new price of $10, at the new price of $10, six units would be sold. Um, let's go ahead and stick that into the formula. I put the formula here to review. Um, the change in quantities, five minus six is negative one. The average of the two quantities, five plus six divided by two is five and a half. So those are the values that we put into the numerator here. Um, in the denominator, dollars in the denominator, the change in prices, 15 minus 10 is 5, and the average of the two prices, um, 15 plus 10 divided by 2, is 12 and a half. So when we move forward with the calculations, um, that brings us to an answer of negative 0.45, or dropping the negative sign, our answer is 0.45. So what does this mean? This means that since our answer is less than 1 but greater than 0, demand is inelastic for this particular good in this range of prices and quantities. All right, so this is where we end for today. More elasticities of demand will be coming up in the next lecture. All right, happy calculations. <laughs>